right. <laughs> hey, it's like, <laughs> hey, <laughs> you know, I can't even look at y'all right now. Let me, let me tell you why I love this church is that, you know, I, I walked out into the, uh, to the lobby. This just happened just a couple of minutes ago. And, you know, as I'm trying to get focused, you know, I see Brother Yared, you know, and Brother Yared walks up to me. And me and Yared, we always have conversation, you know, every single week. You never know what it's going to be about. And he shook my hand and he's laughing at me, you know, and I'm like, oh, man, you know, yeah, it was so funny. Like, he was like, he's like, oh, I remember that shirt from about five years ago. You know, I was just like, oh, OK. All right. We hating on my shirt now, Yared. OK. He was like, man, he was like, I haven't seen that one in a long time. I'm like, yeah, you didn't pray for me about the message today. Nothing, you know. But, uh, you know, you got to love this church. So um, I pray that uh, you were blessed uh, last week. Uh, Pastor Josh brought it home last week, preaching about eternal life, while my wife and I were enjoying the goodness of Cottonwood, Arizona. And so I got an opportunity to uh, just kind of get away and, um, and hang out. And so, uh, you know, very, just very appreciative of that time. And so um, if we can, let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 16. Today is the end of our sermon series, and uh, we're going to end with a doozy here. Luke chapter 16. And I'm going to read from verse 19. The rich man and Lazarus. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he's comforted here, and you are in anguish. Verse 26. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Today, the final question is one in which we all struggle with. What happens to us when we die? What happens to us when we die? Two years ago, I had the most uncomfortable privilege to preach at my cousin's funeral. My cousin, I moved out when I was 16 years old. And my cousin, and whom had five children, I lived with her. So a three or four bedroom mobile home in Wichita, Kansas. My cousin 
was my closest family member and still is to this day. And when I heard the news, I was broken. Broken. I was broken, but I wasn't hopeless. I was broken, but I wasn't suffering at the thought of where her soul may be. And so if you can imagine, it was the most difficult sermon that I ever had to preach. It was already a difficult morning, Pastor John remembers, as I sat in the office of the pastors and elders, ready to put hands on a pastor and his elders because of the blatant disrespect that was happening behind the scenes prior to this moment. And I can remember Pastor John, like the pit bull that he is, he said, I got it, and we'll be good. And so if you can imagine, standing before family and friends, most, if not all, were heartbroken, but I was smiling. I was smiling. And as her children were in the front, young men and young women that I've spent a lot of time with, I was able to share with them this. I said, I can tell you right now, I said that your mother is with Christ. And I said, because there's some things that I know that you may not know. And I said, your mother, I said, came here to Phoenix, Arizona, unsaved like myself. What she didn't know, and this is what something I would suggest, my wife and I, we pray over our house and we pray in specific rooms. And we had prayed for one specific room that it would be a room of salvation. And we have seen over the years that we've had at least four people who have stayed in that room who have been saved. So my cousin came to this church, fell in love with the people, but more importantly, fell in love with Christ. She went home. She called me after she had left and she said, I want a relationship with Christ. I don't know where I'm going to end up, but I want to be with Christ. How do I do that? And I began to share the gospel with her. She not only confessed, but repented in her life, even though up and down was still chained to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I was able to share with her children and her family. I said that your mother would call me constantly. And she'd always start with clowning, saying that you're the younger cousin, but you're my pastor. And she would call for wisdom she would call for advice because she says, I desire to glorify God. Death can be uncomfortable, but to stand before the people and to smile, not to put a smile on, but to smile and to know that we are not hopeless. See, now I am not here to preach a message of death. I'm here to preach a message of life through death. We start with this text because I believe that this text, it gives us understanding, but we have to be very careful not to stretch it beyond what it's saying. What happens to us when we die? It's not only an important question, but it is an emotional question because every one of us have dealt with death. A mother, a cousin, a father, a friend, a co-worker. We've all dealt with death. It's uncomfortable and so we make up words to make it feel more comfortable. They were laid to rest. They're sleeping. Those words indicate... There is an aspect of our lives in which we cannot avoid. 
It's a date that we will not miss. But we try everything in our power to avoid it. Some of us may have gray hair. You want to use different colors to avoid the appearance that you're getting old and moving closer to death. There are some of us who may go get liposuction and try to look your very best to look young to battle those thoughts that you're dying. From the moment that we get breath in our lungs, we are dying each and every day. But how will you spend that time? Unavoidable. Unavoidable for all, maybe except for Elijah and Enoch. From the very beginning of time, we have attempted to explain it away. To make us feel better about it. Some would say that, well, death is part of reincarnation. We just keep doing this thing over and over again. And based upon whatever deeds that you have and this good karma. And and for some of you who keep saying this, we're putting good energy out into the world. Let's stop that. Because karma and... Reincarnation are locked into one another. So individuals will try to put out good energy and good deeds into the world, hopefully so that they don't end up a rat, a dog, a flea. And then good deeds as a flea, as a gnat, as a dog, and then hopefully a human being again, and then keep moving up and keep moving up. It's just never ending. Well, there are some who believe we have zero purpose, that we are literally on the same level as flies and gnats, and essentially that we have no purpose in this life and we're simply annihilated. We just don't exist. That we are simply a compilation of atoms and matter. And that when we die, essentially everything goes blank and the movie is over. There is no need to sit in the movie and wait for the next trailer. It's over. Done. Don't exist. Or for some that come from different religious practices like the Muslim, it's a hedonistic paradise. That God is not there. They get hundreds of women And they have servants at their beck and call. Or some, based upon your Catholic background, purgatory, where there's another attempt to purge the sin. We try to explain it away, but... And even in Christianity, I don't think we examine this enough. We just get... To go to heaven. Is that what all of this has been about? A place? See, did you notice something in everything that I just named? It's not relational. It's not relational at all. If we can go back to Eden, we get a very good understanding that it wasn't about the garden. Because if it was about the garden, when we got kicked out, then it should have been the end of our existence. If it was about the garden. What is it? Biblically speaking, when we die, we get to be with Yahweh and Yeshua. It's relational. The father gets his children that were lost. And now they are found. When the prodigal son began to come back, was it about him being at home? Or was his whole thoughts upon being back with the family? See, we, we lose that relational component when we're always talking about getting to heaven. And then God just simply is just a bonus. No, it's relational. 
We are in a corporate covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. And in that covenant relationship, we are part of a covenant community and we are his children, his sons and his daughters. I thank God every day that he's put eternity in our hearts. A desire not simply just to go home, but to be at home with the father and the son. Look, if there's one thing the Bible is not silent on, it's death. Oh, it speaks. But are we listening? Because like I said, to speak of death is to begin with life. To begin with life. And as we move through this sermon, I want you to see we're going to start with life. And we're going to end with life. If we go back to this story in Luke 16, many of us have heard the story. But there's some key truths that we will explore that I pray opens up our understanding of what happens to us when we die. See, the way that we live today reveals if eternity matters tomorrow. The way that we live today reveals if eternity matters tomorrow. The rich man. What does the Bible say? It says that he was clothed in purple and fine linen. He was feasting every day. There was an abundance of life. Through his possessions. But he ignored Lazarus, each day, think about it. He was on the side of the gate every day begging. The wild dogs, not domesticated, the wild dogs were licking his sore. So you got to think there's an aspect of fear. There's an aspect of begging. And you see two individuals living. But there is an appearance that I think sometimes cloaks the understanding of who's saved and who isn't. See, what this story teaches us is that all daily decisions have future ramifications. Have everything from, the, from you sitting here and listening from getting in your car, it has future ramifications. This is something, and I need you guys to help me. This is something I'm trying to tell my children each and every day. Why? Because as they're in school, in elementary, in junior high, they don't really think those letter grades matter much for tomorrow. They don't begin to see how the way in which they treat people matters for tomorrow. And it's no different with us. Every single decision you make has future ramifications. See, you'll see in someone's life if eternity matters by how it is that we treat one another. How we treat one another. But hold on, there's, a, there's another part. We'll also see if eternity matters by the way that we embrace natural evil and moral decay. The natural evil, the war, the strife, the death, those things that have been a result of the moral evil of rebelling against God. And... How we view eternity matters because if we begin to see the evil in the world and begin to be like, well, where's God? And that tells you that your view on eternity is skewed. Or the manner in which we treat people and walk over them and act as if they are not there. But all of this is in view 
of the love of God. The Bible says that we are to love thy Lord, thy God, with all thy heart, mind, and soul, and to love others as ourselves. It's connected, not divorced. So you want to see if someone has received the love that, they be, that they're able to give freely is seen not in how loud you sing in worship. Not even how many salt and lights you get to go to. But the everyday decisions that you make and how you treat one another. You know what goes in line with that? Forgiveness. And how we treat one another. See, when the God of all eternity is in view of life and death, then every action matters. Every action matters. You know what that means? It makes life purposeful. Everything purposeful. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. The Bible says this, looking to Jesus, watch this, the founder and perfect of our faith. You think Jesus had eternity in view? Okay, watch this. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy was in view. When the joy is in view, pay attention to this, then there's vision. When there is vision, then your sacrifices and the dying daily begins to make sense. He was able to embrace the humiliation, the shame for our sake, because he knew on the other side there was joy. Joy. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all, everybody say all. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil, what he has done yesterday, what he has done today, what he has done tomorrow, when, while you were in the body. Now, as a believer in Christ, there is no fear in judgment that what we receive is that of a lesser or greater reward based upon what we've done. But for the unbeliever, there will be judgment and the type of judgment that is in relationship to you either responding or rejecting the gospel of Jesus Christ. He died so that we would live for him. That we would live for him. If I were to leave you with anything in this particular section. Live a life that you won't regret at the hour of your death. You don't have to wait till tomorrow. Live a life that you don't have to regret at the hour of your death. One of the powerful privileges that I get is to sit at the bedside of men and women who are about to pass away. And you know what you see? You see what an individual has been standing on. The moments in which I have had to listen to people in their last hours will forever impact me and will forever inspire me. Men and women, that when you look in their eyes, you actually see light. You see light. You see a joy. Because for them to live is Christ and to die is gain. Live a life that you won't regret at the hour of your death. Let's move on. What else does this passage teach us? It's that death will separate us from this life, but it will not separate us from the love of Christ. Death will separate us from this life, but won't separate us from his love. But what is death? What is death? Death is but separation. 
in different senses. Death is, first and foremost, separation of the soul slash spirit and the body. Separation. The body no longer functions. The body goes into the grave. And the soul, based upon your relationship with Christ, will dictate where it is that you go. But there's also the spiritual death, the spiritual separation. And there is that spiritual separation that has occurred from the garden. And the rebellion against God and the curse that was inflicted as punishment against the rebellion of mankind. But there is an aspect of separation and death that is forever. Right now there is a separation temporarily. But there will be a day where that death is everlasting. And there will be everlasting separation from God and his glory. But death is something else. Death is a pathway. Death is a pathway to life. See, it's like what Pastor Josh was preaching on last week about eternal life. We get eternal life now. Now. We are not like those of other faiths that say, well, do enough. And then when you die, possibly you may receive and reap a redemptive reward. We get eternal life now. And so even now, he talks about that to live is to do what? Die. What does Jesus come to do? The famous quote, he comes to bid a man farewell to his life. To die. But why death? Death was not the original plan. Death entered the world through man. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21. I'm going to turn there myself. You guys still with me? Okay. 15. 21. For as by a man came what? Death. Death. But that's not the end of the story. By a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Yes, amen. But death also in the natural causes for every man, woman, and child to pause. To pause. Now, we all deal with death differently, don't we? Some have a a spirit that doesn't sit well with it. So you must get up and do things and keep yourself busy. Some can't stop talking about it. Some it grips in ways in which there's a a seriousness to an understanding of their life. But for everyone, whether in public or private, it will cause for you to pause. And you know what you'll do? You reflect on your life. Death is a call to repentance. To cause for us not to say, I don't want to end up like, no, no, we're we're all going to end up in that box now. But it causes for you to stop. That's why, for example, that's why you have individuals, it may be some of your cousins, your uncles, sisters, brothers, They go to jail. They go to prison. You know what happens? Life slows down. They pause. They think. And what happens? They walk out. And for the most part, it typically sounds like this. I found God. No, 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 brother. God always been here. You didn't find God. You stopped. And prison made you pause. 
and reflect on your relationship with your creator. It never fails. I don't care how many funerals I've done. It never fails. I don't care. I don't care where anyone is at in regards to relationship. At that time, everybody's quiet. And you see different people sitting down. They're comforting and they're thinking about like, my God, what happened? And then they start to ask, like, is this going to happen to me? And how and when? And, and all of a sudden, and it's a call for us to repent. It's like what me and Josh, we, we talk about sometimes in our, our meetings. Look, we were at one time good. Mankind was at one time good. So you have to understand that God is not beginning with us as sinners. He's beginning with the beginning that we were good. And that as we are good to get us back to that. It's a return to even a better eating with new heavenly bodies. We were not destined to die. We were destined to live. We were destined to be loved. Jesus redeemed us. Let's go to Romans chapter 8, verse 38 through 39. For I am sure that neither what? Death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, or death, nor anything else that you want to come up with in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. And what is that love? That love was shown on Calvary. That love wasn't just confessional. That love was a demonstration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And nothing in all creation can separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. This is why we have to really remove ourselves from the American gospel. Why? You see where Lazarus ended up, right? Lazarus' life was hard. It's hard. He suffered greatly. We don't know for how long. But hold on now. He didn't live a comfortable life. At all. Didn't live a comfortable life. But it didn't separate him from the love of Yahweh. We have to separate from this American gospel. And it's an American gospel that says you deserve to live comfortably. You deserve to live comfortably. And then what happens is the purpose of your life is simply just to surround yourself with as much comfort as possible. Think about it. He did not allow for his earthly circumstances to dictate his eternal comfort. Well, what am I saying? He kept going back to the gate. He's there. But he ends up at the bosom of Abraham. On the outside looking in, we'd be thinking like, well, no, it should be the rich man. The American gospel should say, The rich man gets into heaven. See, the blessings of God were not upon this Lazarus. And then, like the meme I've seen, surprise, 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 surprise. I know, Aunt Joel, you're like, where where is he coming from with that? (laughs) See, comfort in this life is a poor indication of the compassion of Jesus. Comfort in this life is a poor indicator of the love of Jesus in your life. 
poor indicator? In some ways, yes. But if that is your primary way of determining if God is blessing you, then what happens is that when you go through your storms, you're going to act as if they were never to come. Jesus, what? And then you start this. What have I done? Oh, you're living. You're not immune. Like, you're going to suffer through some things. May even drown. Still love you, though. Can we, can we deal with that? Can we deal with that? See, just because we are in Christ doesn't afford you a comfortable death. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you are utilizing the way in which people die to indicate if God is pleased with them, you're way off. Because Jesus died a very uncomfortable death. And there was justice and love poured out. And what we would have to say is, what did Jesus do wrong? Nothing but obey. The apostle Paul, all he did was preach the gospel. And how did it end for him? Execution. See, none of the apostles got a comfortable death. Not everybody could die like Abraham. Well in his old age, taking his last breath before the family. But if we see someone in a car accident, or if the flames took up the whole house, then they must have done something wrong. No, we live in a fallen world. And because Jesus, cling, 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 holds the keys of death in Hades, We return, baby. The sting is gone. You will feel pain. You will suffer. It's in the word of God. But that ain't the end of the story. We go right into glory. And it's like those YouTube reels. You know, somebody fighting somebody, all of a sudden they end up in heaven. You see those. Like with that security guy. You know, he was just like, hey, do this and, and turn around. And then all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, 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 my G. Like, hey, you, you in heaven now. They're looking around. I'm just telling you that in the manner in which we die, don't get caught up with that. I could finish preaching and have a heart attack right now. Does that indicate that Will was doing something wrong in his private life? No. Does it say that God is dis- that he's not pleased with me? No. You're not promised to get what you want when you die. But you will receive eternity. And if that ain't good enough, I'm sorry. That's all that God has to give. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 through 10. Look at what the Apostle Paul is saying here. He says we are always, everybody say always. And he is speaking to the church. We are always of good courage. You know what that means? It means confident assurance. All right, now let's go see where this goes. So let me say it this way. We always have confident assurance. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by what? Faith. Now we start to understand Lazarus a little bit. He wasn't walking by sight. He was walking by faith, even though he was begging at the gate. See, there are people who are homeless, but they're not hopeless. They're not hopeless. See, so we walk by faith, not by sight. Because if you walk by sight, it ain't going to make sense. It's not going to make sense to you. So he goes forward, he says, yes, he affirms it again. We are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body. And at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, whether I'm living or dying, we make it our aim to do what? Please him. How do we do that? By faith. By faith. And then you get this last little caveat there in Luke 16. Hopefully you caught it. Hopefully I don't mess with too many people's theology today. He was carried by angels. 
the Bible says that angels encamp around those who fear him. There are angels all around us. You know that when you were in traffic and that car was getting ready to hit and it went around you. I got ministering spirits. Angels all around me. Now think about this. The Bible says the rich man was, he got a good funeral. He didn't even say that Lazarus was buried. He didn't say he got a good funeral. <laughs> but his entrance into paradise? That brother got angels. I don't know what that rich man got. But he got angels. That's like rolling up with you know, Mercedes Benzes. Like he just he was like this. You know, just hop out the car. It's just like, you know, I'm here. Well, what's up? What's going on? But we look over that. You don't just boom, pop. Angel, like, let me, hold on now. I love you so much. Let me usher you in. Let me usher you in. Oh, it's beautiful here. Look, our next stop is the immediate confirmation of your relational status with Jesus. Oh, let me say it. Our next stop, not final, our next stop is the immediate confirmation of your relational status with Jesus. I found this quote interesting. It says, The afterlife consists of two types of people. Those who have said to God, Your will be done. And those to whom God says, Your will be done. Because it's in response to the good news of who Christ is and what he's done. Now, I want to take a moment. I'm going to step over here. Because there's something here. But what about the infants? What about those with cognitive disabilities? We must be very careful with what I call weak evidence. Weak evidence, still evidence, okay? Still the word of God. But weak evidence is when we take one passage and we turn it into the fullness of an entire doctrine. We can stand on weak evidence, but to attempt to apply it to every situation would be a danger. So this is what I will share. And it is no different than what I've shared with individuals who've lost loved ones, especially young ones. Many of you guys know I had to do a funeral for a four-year-old who died in a wrong way collision, make news around here. Can you imagine that? Left the casket open the whole time. But the Bible speaks about briefly. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23, you don't have to turn there. But David has hope that he will see his dead infant again. Not here on this earth, but again. It's pretty much the only passage that we have outside of understanding the character and the nature of God saying, let the little ones come. For those who are, who have Uh, cognitive disabilities. Let me just share with you where I've landed. I've landed where we should all land. On the righteousness of the Father. Why do we land there? We don't start with the person. We always start with God. Let me tell you why. Because in his righteousness, as a father, he never gets it wrong. You, never get, you don't have to worry about God getting it wrong. You don't have to worry about him looking through like an insurance adjuster. Looking for places where it's like, oh, but that's this and then it's that and it's, I, I don't know. I trust in the righteous father. I trust that every time he will always make the best decision possible. He never gets it wrong. 
But think about it. If our next stop is the immediate confirmation of our relational status with Jesus, think about where Lazarus was. He was where? Abraham's side. You know what happens? Death actually reveals whose side you're really on. We can talk about it, but it really, truly reveals what side you're on. Hold on now. It's bigger than that, though. Because the rich man thought that by his religion, he would be redeemed. How did he address Abraham? Father Abraham, I am of ethnic descendants. Oh, let me say it this way. I am of my parents' faith. I go to church. I do everything that they've done. By my works, I should be good to go. What we're seeing is the difference between religion and redemption. And why I began at the very start that death is relational. And then we try to make it transactional. So what did the rich man want? He wanted transaction. Help me out. Nah. Nah. Because this is what religion without redemption will get you. You will have everything you ever want on this earth. Everything. Your earth, your, I'm going to say it this way, your heaven will be now. And then for believers in Christ, this will be the worst aspect of something hell like that we will ever experience. I, I think it may be, you know, 72 degrees, you know, in heaven. Because it's seeing pretty hot, you know, down at the bottom. But see, behavior without the blood of Christ will get you this. Because nothing else will get you in. Nothing. Nothing. But you know what it revealed? It's something crazy here. If you're not paying attention. He thought he knew God and didn't. Whoa. He thought he knew God because he knew facts about God. He thought he knew God because he was going to church. He thought he knew God, Josh, because he could memorize some scriptures. He even could say, Father Abraham. But did you, did you catch how Father Abraham responded? He called him child, not son. Child, I, I see you as a child. But as a son, that would mean that you know God. Because those who know me will be blessed. You know God. But what else do we see here in this next stop? It's immediate comp confirmation. Immediate. It is not, we wait around. It is immediate confirmation. Now watch where I'm going. Because it's going to get tricky here. I didn't say immediate judgment. I said immediate confirmation of your relational status. Because the second coming hasn't occurred. And when the second coming, there's final judgment. And we go to the book of Revelation. He brings everybody up. So he doesn't just go like, you're judged. Okay, I got another one. You're judged. Nope. It'll be public. And it will be powerful. But you get to be in his presence today. Today. Think about the joy of the thief of the cross. He's dying. But this day, today, you will be with me in paradise. I don't believe that was some like thousand years from now, day type thing. No, no, no. Today. Because that would really suck if he really meant a thousand years. <laughs> right? Like, Jesus, you're playing with me now. Right? Today you will be with me in paradise. Do you know what? Do you guys know? Or do you remember what the thief did? The thief was actually proclaiming the gospel on the cross. Because the thief who was condemned kept talking. Do you know who this is? <laughs> I'm going to be in paradise. Why are you? You know, Jesus, you said today, right?
Because in this, the next stop, it's, a, it's, it's an aspect of the kingdom of God. It's a now and not yet aspect. There are things that must happen. But there's another aspect of it that we're conscious and not just sleep. The Bible says in that great chasm that the rich man was being tormented. Once again, not final destination. We're going to get to that in a second. And he could see. Do you, do you get this for a second? Because we go through this in life. If we, if we can understand what this is really saying, like it, it, it'll blow your mind. You know what one of the worst experiences in life is when you see somebody doing something that you were supposed to be doing and they get rewarded for it. And they get rewarded for it. You know all those things that, you know, your friends, your family kept telling you, like, you should do this. No, you need to make this change. No, you need to stop doing this. And then you see somebody who does. And then you get to see that for almost eternity. What's interesting is that as I've been reading, not one time do I read within the word of God that anyone, whether in paradise, and we get to that in a second, or heaven is looking down at the torment. Because that would be painful, wouldn't it? But those in whom are in pain are looking up because it's separation. You can, God, help me. Help me. No, this is what you wanted. The way you lived on earth, because remember, today matters. You may be saying, I got, I only had three opportunities to hear the gospel. Well, you're not guaranteed that you're always going to get 10 chances with things. It's like with my child. There are moments in which my child will run his mouth and he will get popped as he should. And then there are moments in which he'll run his mouth and I'll get on a knee and we'll talk. But then what happens is that when I don't talk to him again, he gets popped. He's like, I thought you were going to talk to me. You're not guaranteed that every time is going to be a discussion. There's no dialogue in discipline. But you'll, it, they're conscious. Like you go, if you even go back to Luke 13, it says that there will be the weeping and gnashing of teeth because they will see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they'll be saying, that's where I should be. Amen. And not only that, they'll actually see the Gentiles. It's like, what, what's going on here? And you get to witness it. You're conscious. And not only that, it was... There's conscious pain. Now, I don't understand all of this. The man yet, the rich man has yet to receive his resurrected body. And we'll get to that in a second. But in the spirit, he is experiencing torment and pain. So it's not just the awareness of what was going on previously, but there's the conscious sense of pain. The conscious sense of pain. Think about this, and, and, and I don't know who has spread this throughout Christianity when it's like when we get there, we won't know one another, right? I've heard that. You know, like, hey, you're married, but, you know, in heaven you're not married. Yeah, but I better know who my wife is. Like, you know, like, but remember that we got married. You know, maybe I may be looking at her in heaven, Josh, just like, remember we used to be married. You know, just remember that. No, I'm just playing with you. You can, you can delete that. But what I'm saying is this. What I'm saying is this, that it's the memory. The rich man is talking about his father and his brothers. He remembers. Your memory is not zapped. You're conscious, you're aware, and you remember. But it's a temporary place. That's why it's the next stop. You go to the Old Testament, they talk about Sheol. It's the abode of both. Now watch this. Now here's the thing. Before I even get into this, I'm going to touch on it and I'm going to keep moving. I am not here to die on a hill when it comes down to eschatology. I am not here to die on a hill when we start talking about last things. You know why? Because none of us know. 
we have some facts within the scripture of certain events. But my God, putting it all together is very difficult. And I'm still growing. And so I pray that you stay growing because there's so much to learn. Because some would see that the abode of the righteous and the unrighteous is Hades. Hades, Sheol, Hades is Sheol in the Greek. And the belief was is that as there was separation from the body, that the body would go to the grave, but that then there was a deeper level in the middle of the earth. And in the middle of the earth, that's where the soul would go. Then, <laughs> watch where I'm going, but then there's levels. Okay, there is Tartarus at the end where there is the gloomy pit in which the angels are held. Then you go to another level, and that other level is that torment in which the rich man is experiencing right now. Now, this is where it gets tricky, because some would say, okay, well, in Hades, we see that this man is in paradise, Abraham's bosom. Paradise just means garden. So heaven, paradise, it could get confusing. But based upon where you're coming at it and with this angle, you're going to either see it as separate or just a higher level of Hades where the individual is not tormented. That's all I got to say on that. But here it is. Don't get caught up on the different names because the only thing that's final is the new heaven, the new earth, and new Jerusalem. Everything else, temporary. It's holding tank. Now, with that being said, here's the other part that you have to wrestle with. Time doesn't exist. Did you guys hear me? Time doesn't exist there. Oh, well, well Will, where'd you get that from? God is beyond that. He's beyond time, space, matter. Time is not the same. So a lot of things that look very um, sequential to us, it doesn't work out that nice and neat. It just doesn't. And so because one may ask, well, then what are we doing with God or in the presence of believers until the second coming? Are we just playing pickleball? <laughs> right? Now watch what happens. This is, this is key, key. Because if you can't answer that question, then what will happen is you will believe that your eternity is just simply praising God. That's what you'll think. So then what happens is the hope you know, it starts to disappear and the groaning for what's coming next starts to disappear because you're just like, well, I'm basically just entering to an eternal church service where we're just going there to praise him all day long. And that's it. Holy, 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 holy. You'd be like, Man, this is what I died for on earth. Like, holy, holy. I, 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 believe me, I'm not belittling it. What I'm saying is that if your understanding of heaven is this small, that's what you will think. You will simply think, I'm just there like, glory, glory, hallelujah. No, 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 no. No, no, no. It's more than that. It's more than that. Like I said, this is a confirmation of your relational status. Here's the thing. Your status follows you into the afterlife. Well, how do we know that? Now, watch this. Did you catch how the rich man was speaking to Father Abraham about Lazarus? He's still in his sinful nature. Hey, hey, hey. Because I'm somebody. Y'all seen that pastor who did that? Like, I'm somebody. Tell Lazarus. Do you hear that? Tell Lazarus, you know, dip his finger in some water, bring it to me. Your status follows you into the afterlife. If you were justified, 
eternally secure in right standing with God, you know what will happen? Your status will follow you. You're forever forgiven. Your status will follow you. Look, I don't want to call anybody out. Now, I know we got a judge here too, okay? If you're a felon, you understand this. If you're a felon, you understand this. Because your status follows you everywhere you go. You go to Kansas, you're going to get the same application we all got. Got a criminal background? Go ahead and say no if you want to. They got some real slick ways of getting your background now. You end up checking that box. You know what happens? That comes with some stigma, unfortunately. But if you've had your record expunged, there's no record. It's as if you never committed the crime. And no matter if I go to Hawaii, no matter if I go to Idaho, no matter if I go to Canada, I can check that box. Nah, not me, because my status goes with me, and it doesn't have borders. You guys still with me? Let me go ahead and land this. Our final state is the full experience of everlasting life. So do we start with life and we end with life? But think about it. This is where the rich man and Lazarus, the story ends. It ends. It doesn't talk about the future glorification. But Jesus does. Now, like I said, the timeline of things can be highly debatable all day long. But I want you to understand it's kaleidoscopic. It's colorful. There's things that are going on. But watch this. This is wild. Even though it's kaleidoscopic, it's unified. It's unified. And not only that, it's final. In the view of God, or more importantly, Jesus' second coming, he's coming to judge. It's final judgment. And you and I get to see the fullness of the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, watch this. How many of you guys have ever seen Conan the Barbarian? Okay, that's the Jesus you're going to meet. Oh, no, 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 not the suffering servant. Oh, no, no, not in the decaying meat jacket that he had on. Oh, no, you get to face line of Judah. Why do you think Jesus in his high priestly prayer was like, I just want to get back to the, to the glory that I had with you before everything was created? He wants to get back to the fullness of his glory. He was, remember, he came down here in humility. He chose to suffer alongside us so that we would experience what he's experienced for all eternity. So in his second coming, all right, that brother's got a tattoo, right? He got a tattoo on his side. I ain't lying, right? This brother's coming in, and it is not going to be old sweet Jesus. It ain't going to be old nice Jesus. He coming in like Conan. Because he's coming to destroy. I want you to think, I want to let that settle. Nice Jesus. Oh, the lamb. No, lion of Judah. It's terrifying. You get to see, you get to see Jesus in the fullness. When you see Jesus, let me, my God. Think about Peter in the boat. He just got a sense of who Jesus was. And he got down, depart from me, I'm a sinner. He was in the presence of holiness and that's what happened. Think about being in the presence of the Lion of Judah. You hear him before you see him. That's just like my good friend, Brian Dawkins. How many of you guys know who Brian Dawkins is? All right, those who are football fans, right? B. Doc was my first Hall of Fame guy that I got to work with. And B. Doc, when you met him, calm, gentle. But that was not who this brother was. They called this brother Weapon X. And when he 
when he got on the field, you got to see the fullness of who he really was. And he let that fury out on everybody. He would destroy guys and guys' career. And then after the game, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> he scared me one day in Athlete's Bible study. I was preaching, and this brother got on his knees, thank you, Jesus, in the middle of me. I was like, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah. I'm like, oh, my God. Okay, this brother's intense. But what I'm saying is that there's a fullness there. And within that fullness, like you get to see somebody in that light. Look, we'll all face judgment. But we'll face it. Either on the side of the line of Judah. Or on the other side. But here's the thing. You don't get to approach him on your terms. His terms are in his books. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 20. And I'm going to read this because, to be honest with you, I assume the majority of us do not read the book of Revelation. And that's why a lot of our understanding of death is incomplete. It says, when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison. And will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. Watch this. And for anybody that's out there, I, and I just want to destroy some theology right now. For any of you out there that really believe, that really believe that Satan is fighting God. That really believe that like Satan is just like some commendable foe. I just want you to see something really clear here. And they marched up over the broad plain. Are we getting this picture now? The enemy, all of his armies. They marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. This is how fast the war went. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. Where's this battle? It's over. Just like that. There is no, oh, God is like, you got to warm up. <laughs> fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire. That's that last part, the abyss. It's never ending. And sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and on him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away. Remember I talked about that? The presence and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. You see this final judgment? It's coming together. And what was open? Books. Books were open. Then another book was open, which is what? The book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books. It's not on your terms. According to what they had done. Watch this. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades, they're personified here. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is what? The second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Are we getting a picture here? But I want to say this. We see that the righteous and unrighteous will be resurrected. They will be resurrected to life or to eternal death. We're raised in glory. But being raised in glory, we are raised in glory in a glorified environment. But Jesus removed the sting of death. That's why our bodies can come back to us in a resurrected form. Why? Because death can't hold you in the grave. It can't hold you in the grave. He's got the keys. He's got the keys. But. We 
if you're stirred right now, thinking about this lake of fire, and I pray that it would even stir the zeal for what we truly believe in the gospel. I want us to remember one thing. It's avoidable. It's avoidable. Oh, Will, what are you saying? Repent and believe. Repent and believe. It's avoidable. It's avoidable. Repent and believe. We get to be fully alive with him. All things being made new. If you think about it, it's the end of hope. It's the end of hope. It's the end of it. It is it's the end of salvation. It's consummated. It's complete. Our final state is a full experience of everlasting life. Because in this final state, new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, you get to experience what it really means to live. What it really means to live. Let me say it this way. Imagine there's a a championship game. It's the last game of the year. Championship. There's different ways to experience that game. Well, back in my day, you'd pick up a newspaper. You'd read about it, what happened the day before. <clears throat> Nowadays, you can get on your phone. <clears throat> you can read about it in real time. But is that really experiencing the game? No. Then there's another aspect of maybe staying in the neighborhood. You hear the cheers. You hear the roar of the crowd but you're still not experiencing the game, not in its totality. Then you get entrance into the stadium. And some of us will get those nosebleed seats. You get your binoculars, you're at the game, but it's still not the full experience. And then you get closer. You get those good seats that sometimes I get. That's why brothers be signing up, take me to the game. Even though we're there, we can, we can smell what's going on on the field. You can hear what's going on. Is that the totality of the experience? No. Then you move to the sideline. Now you're bumping elbows with the head coach. He's telling you, get out of my way. You can touch the players, but is that still the full experience? No. It's not until you get out there. And you're actually in the game and you're like, this is what it's about. And you see it and you see everything else from a totally different perspective. But that's still not the totality of the experience. Because if you were on the winning side, it's a whole different experience. Because when the game is won, especially when you're playing a game that's rigged. A game where you know the end, that you're going to be victorious. And you celebrate. You get to go into the locker room. See, there's celebration on the field with everyone. And then there's a moment that no one gets to share except for you and the players who through blood, sweat, tears, and suffering have now reached a place of glory. And they close the door and they say no media can get in. Not even your mama, not your daddy, not your son, not your daughter. We get to celebrate. That's the totality of the glorified experience. If we can think about that each and every day, then it will change the way you live now. So what happens when you die? Just do what I did. Read your Bible. And ask Jesus. And he'll show you the way. Let us pray.
wherever you were at in your relationship with Christ. I pray that as the message went forth, you understood how serious these moments are. If Jesus is truly